Hey everybody, it's Monday, March 1st. And as you can see here in the aim today, our goal for today's video is to synthesize concepts of conservation of momentum and experimental data analysis. Now, after the last video, hopefully you realize here, we are making our way towards the end of the conservation of momentum unit. And in the last video, we took a brief look at an example of a kind of experiment that you could do using concepts of conservation of momentum. And so for today, I'd like to take a look at another one by looking at uh, a question which previously appeared on a practice exam for the AP test. So if you go to the attachment uh, for today's video, you will see a worksheet which contains a graph that looks like this. And it says here, the figure above represents two carts with magnets attached that make up a system. The mass of one cart and magnet is one kilogram, and the mass of the other is five kilograms. The carts are initially at rest on a frictionless track. They are released from rest and exert a repulsive force on each other. The track is not quite horizontal, with the right side slightly lower than the left side. And it says the speeds of the carts are measured over a 10-second interval. The graph below shows the momentum of the two carts as a function of time for this interval as they move along the x-axis. Now, what I like about this question and what really differentiates it from the last question we looked at is that for the last experimental focus question we talked about, we were looking at a perfectly inelastic collision. And now we can take a look at an experiment that really focuses on the explosion problem. And so you see here, basically, this is an explosion problem, whereas instead of the objects uh, exerting forces on each other that are contact forces, like we usually saw either there was a spring between the objects or it's literally just two people who are pushing off of each other, like in the example we solved. Uh, in class, we had a person throwing an object. Here, the objects are exerting forces on each other with the magnets that are attached to them. We actually do have uh, magnets like this in our lab. And so had you been in class, you would have performed an experiment that was like this. But this experimental focused question sort of gives us an example uh, of a perfectly reasonable experimental setup for this kind of situation. So this is the graph. I'd like you to just take a second to really look at the details shown to you in the graph here. I think the key thing to notice is that it's a graph of momentum versus time. And so we go to the first question. And the first question says, based on the graph, where the measurements started at the instant the carts were released? Justify your answer. So take a second to pause this video here and answer this question. Remember, this was on an AP practice exam. For the whole question, which you can't see this in this particular figure, but if you're looking at the worksheet right now, you'll see that it says uh, the suggested time for the whole question is about 13 minutes. So when they give you a, a question like this and it says justify your answer, they're not really looking for an enormous amount of detail. They really kind of just want you to get right to the point. So take a couple minutes to look at this graph here and answer this question. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. Okay, so the question here is asking where the measurements started the instant the carts were released. Really, the whole answer to this question comes down to whether or not you carefully read the initial description of the problem that was given above the graph. The answer here is no. The measurements were started after the carts were released. It's fairly easy to tell if you were looking at the initial description for the problem. Since the initial description says the carts were released from rest, both and should initially have a zero momentum, as momentum is the product of mass and velocity, right? That should make sense here. If the objects start with a zero velocity, because the momentum is directly proportional to the velocity, the objects should have a zero momentum. According to the graph, both carts have a non-zero initial momentum. So the measurements must have started sometime after the carts were already in motion. Now, I'm going to give you a second to just keep this on the screen, but let's just go back to the graph here. Notice, clearly, these objects are starting with a different amount of momentum, period, and a momentum that's not zero. Whereas the problem has this description, which clearly says the carts are initially at rest on a frictionless track. And so that's the deal. Because it says they were initially at rest, the graph shows they were not initially at rest, then they were not initially at rest. If they were initially at rest, they'd have zero momentum. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down, adding any parts of this explanation that might be missing from your own. And when you hit play, we'll move on. Okay, moving on to the second part here, you can take a look at the question that was asked in part B. Part B is saying calculate the magnitude of the external force exerted on the system. 
I like this question because it's a question that's kind of dissimilar from all of the questions that we've seen so far. And I think what's really particularly useful about this question is, you know, despite the fact that you might not have ever seen anything that's looked like this before, if you recognize the key concepts that are generally involved in a problem like this, then you should be able to answer. So before we actually go ahead and take a look at this question, and I'm going to give you some time uh, to try to calculate this on your own. Uh, before we actually go ahead and do that, I want to ask you another question to consider because I think it makes it easy enough to understand. So the first question we're going to answer here is immediately when looking at the graph, you should be able to tell that there's an external net force acting on the system. Why? The second I looked at that graph, I knew there was a net force exerted on the system. The, the second you should have looked at that graph, you should have recognized the same thing. The question is, how can you tell? I want you to take a second to pause this video and think about that here. How can you tell immediately when you're looking at that graph that there's an external net force exerted on the system? When you think you have an idea, hit play and we'll go over it. This is a big, big note here. When there is no external force acting on the system, the impulses experienced by each object should be equal and opposite. That's been something we have talked about for quite a bit. We said the forces exerted on the objects are equal and opposite. The time interval over which those forces are exerted on the object are equal. And so the impulses delivered to each of the objects should be the same. Since the graph lacks that symmetry, because it's a momentum graph, you can clearly see here that instead of the graph being symmetrical about the x-axis, that the gain in one is equal to the gain in the other direction for the other object, since the graph lacks that symmetry, we can immediately tell that the gain in the momentum in the positive direction for the five kilogram object is not the same as the gain in momentum for the one kilogram object in the opposite direction. This is a very important point, because if you recognize that the impulses are supposed to be equal and opposite, and they're not, then you can tell that there's a reason for that. And of course, the reason is, the only reason why the impulses are opposite is because you have those equal and opposite forces, which do act on each object independently. But when you consider both objects as a whole system, then those forces essentially cancel each other out, meaning there's no net force exerted on the system. Because the impulses are not equal and opposite, we know that there's an external force exerted on the system. Take a second to pause this video here and write down this note in your notebook. This is an extremely important point, which will come up again and again as we start to really focus in on the problem-solving aspect uh, in the homeworks for the momentum unit. When you hit play, we'll go back and answer question in part B. All right, so keeping in mind that the lack of an equal and opposite impulse is the exact reason why there is a net external force exerted on the system, I'd like you to go ahead and solve for the magnitude of that force. It's very important to realize there are a lot of different ways for you to solve for the net external force exerted on the system, but it's very important for this question in particular to remember that Newton's second law was not written as F net equals MA by Newton. The relationship Newton focused in on was not the relationship between the net force and the acceleration, but rather was between the net force and the momentum. And it's very important to recognize in the reference table for this course, they list the equation as the net force is equal to the time rate of change of momentum. And so if you know how much the momentum changes by in a certain amount of time, this equation allows you directly to determine the amount of force acting on that object. What I'd like you to do is go ahead and calculate the force exerted on each object using the data from the graph. And then once you have the force exerted on each object, I want you to think about what makes logical sense in terms of determining the net force exerted on the system as a whole. And when you think you've come up with the answer, hit play, and we'll go over it. Okay, so to my mind, and there are a lot of different ways you could do this, but to my mind, it makes sense to use the entire time interval shown in this graph. 
really for two reasons. The first reason is it gives you a better picture of what's happening throughout the entire time interval to use the whole time interval rather than a selected part of it. But in particular, what also makes it nice about using the entire time interval is that the value of that time interval happens to be 10 seconds. And so that means when you're taking that change in momentum and then you're dividing it by the time, you don't actually need to use your calculator for that. You'll just go ahead and divide it by 10, and that's an easy calculation to do. You just basically move the decimal point one place to the left. So because the force is equal to the time rate of change of momentum, and you're going to need then the final and initial momentum for both objects in order to be able to do this calculation, we want to focus in on the graph here first. Notice at the end of the 10 seconds, the five kilogram object has what looks to me like a final momentum of 1.25 kilogram meters per second. Initially, that to me looks like it's about halfway between 0 and 0 0.5, so we'll call that 0 0.25. For the 1 kilogram object, shown by the dots here, we can see that in the very beginning, this object looks like it has a momentum, which the dot is indicated right in between uh, the 0 and the negative 0.5, but to me it actually looks a little bit closer to the 0. So we'll go ahead and call that negative 0 0.2 instead of negative 0 0.25. It looks a little closer to the 0 than it does to the 0.5. Same thing for the final momentum here. It's obviously not halfway between negative 0.5 and 1. It's not at 0.5, but it's very close to it. And so we'll go ahead and call that negative 0 0.6. And so that's going to inform our calculation here for the force. So let's go ahead and show the work for this properly here. We have for the 5 kilogram object, we have the initial momentum was 0 0.25 kilogram meters per second. We had the final momentum was 1.25 kilogram meters per second. And we have the time interval, easy to deal with here, is 10 seconds. And we're looking for the net force on the 5 kilogram object. And so we'll say the net force is equal to delta P over T, which is the final momentum minus the initial momentum divided by the time. And so that means the net force here is going to be 1.25 kilogram meters per second divided by 0 0.25 kilogram meters per second over 10 seconds. Now, two things to pay attention to here. Number one, notice the units here work out to kilogram meters per second divided by seconds. That's going to give you an answer in units of kilogram meters per second squared, which they should be because we are calculating a force here, and the newton is defined as a kilogram meter per second squared. That's given by the equation F net equals ma, right? Well, it turns out it's also given by this equation here. The second thing to realize is that this is about the easiest calculation you could possibly ask for because you have 1.25 minus 0.25, so that's 1, and then you just have 1 divided by 10. And so the net force on the 5 kilogram card here is 0 0.1 newtons. Now, something to pay attention to here is the way the answer ultimately shakes out. Because notice, in an ordinary circumstance, the forces should be equal and opposite. So the very fact that we've done this calculation here and gotten 0.1 in almost all the circumstances we've looked at so far means we already would know the force acting on the one kilogram object. The force on the one kilogram object would be negative 0.1 because the forces should be equal and opposite. Here, that's not the case. We actually have to go ahead and do the calculation. What I think you'll not be surprised by is that the force is going to be different. And so using the values that we talked about earlier here, the initial momentum is negative 0 0.2 kilogram meters per second. The final momentum is negative 0 0.6 kilogram meters per second. The time here, of course, is 10 seconds. And we're looking for the net force. And so we'll say here, well, the net force is delta P over T, doing the same calculation here, P final minus P initial over the time. And so we have the net force here is negative 0 0.6 kilogram meters per second minus negative 0 0.6. 2 kilogram meters per second, and then we'll have that divided by 10 seconds. And so notice here, negative 0 0.6 minus negative 0.2 is actually negative 0 0.6 plus 0.2, so that's going to be negative 0 0.4 kilogram meters per second. And when we divide that by 10 seconds, we get the net force acting on the 1 kilogram block is negative 0 
for Newtons. Now, ultimately, what we need to consider is that these forces ordinarily should cancel out. If the net force on the 5 kilogram block would be 0.1, we should expect to see on the 1 kilogram block a net force of negative 0.1, but we don't. And if you really think about it that way, the next step should be obvious. The way we usually arrive at the idea that there's zero net force is by adding up the two equal and opposite forces, right? Because if this force, the force on the five kilogram object was 0.1, and this force came out to negative 0.1, adding the two of them would tell us that the net external force is zero. And so all you have to do here to find the net force exerted on the system is add the forces on each object. Now, we've got a little bit of a problem here because both of these are labeled the same, and so we'll just go ahead and put 5 as the subscript for this one because this is the net force on the 5 kilogram object, and we'll put a subscript of 1 on this net force because it's for the 1 kilogram object. So we'll say the net external force, the true net force, is going to be what we've called F net 5 plus F net 1. And so now here, we're just going to add these two numbers. And in a pretty simple fashion here, we're going to end up with 0.1 newtons plus negative 0.04 newtons. And that's going to give us a net force of 0.06 newtons. The net force exerted on the system is 0.06 newtons. Now, let's just be clear about an alternate method before we move on. Another way you could have done this problem, if you saw it as easier, that's obviously a matter of opinion, but you could have just taken the momentum for each object, added them together. That would be the total momentum of the system. And so 0.25 plus negative 0.2 would just be 0.05. That's the initial momentum of the system. At the end, you could have added the momenta here, 1.25 plus negative 0.6, and that would give you the final momentum of the system. And then really, you'd end up just treating this entirely as a systems problem. And so with a final momentum of negative 0.65, or excuse me, that's positive, 0.65, and an initial momentum of 0.05, you would arrive at exactly the same answer. You'd get 0.65 minus 0.005, that would give you 0.6. And then, of course, dividing that by 10 seconds would give you the exact same answer for the net force of 0.06 newtons. Either way of doing it gives you the exact same answer. So ultimately, the choices as to which is preferable is yours. But here's what the calculation ends up giving you. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. All right, last question on this sheet here is part C. Part C says, suppose the experiment is repeated with different carts so that the masses of the cart plus magnet are 2 kilograms and 4 kilograms. Would your answer to part B be different with new masses? It's an interesting question. Take a second to pause this video here and think about the answer to this question, and I really do want you to try to write an explanation on your own. If you think you've come up with an answer, hit play, and we'll go over it. And the answer to part C is the net force remains the same. The key detail here, in my opinion, is thinking about this question in terms of the system. Since the net external force which really here is the X component of gravity. They told you in the initial description of the problem, the ends of the ramp were not uh, at equal heights. They were not level. One, height of the ramp, uh, one side of the ramp ended up being below the other. The X component of gravity, or the external net force, acts on the whole system. And so in order to determine the effect of the net force, you have to consider the total mass present in the system. Since the total mass of the system doesn't change, notice with one kilogram and five kilograms, the total is six. And of course, with the two and four kilogram carts, the total mass is still six. Since the total mass of the system doesn't change, the net force calculated in the new experiment would be the same. The gravitational force on the four kilogram cart, yes, it would be less than the five kilogram cart, but the gravitational force on the two kilogram cart would be more than it was on the one kilogram cart the net effect would be the same then. And it's important to realize that same argument would hold if the external force was friction as well. 
because ultimately the way friction affects objects is dependent on the normal force, which in turn is dependent on their mass. The net force remains the same here because we are treating these two objects as part of a system. And that's the deal. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. And with that, that's it for this problem. I think the main takeaway for you from this problem should be this. In a lot of conservation of momentum problems, we consider the objects separately. We think about the forces acting on those objects. We think about the direction those forces are acting on that object, whether the object is going to speed up, slow down, etc. Here, I hope this problem helped you to realize that sometimes it is very advantageous to consider these objects as a system. They are two separate individual entities, but together, whatever happens to them depends on the other. And so treating them as a single system with two constituent parts is sometimes a really advantageous approach to problem solving. And we'll try to point this out as we go through and solve examples in the homework, because it'll give you sort of a better overall picture of how conservation of momentum works within a system. It's important to realize that that really goes back to first principles here. We never say the momentum of an object is conserved. We say the momentum of a system is conserved. And a system is always going to consist of interacting objects. And the interactions between those objects that make up that part of the system can be looked at in a new light if you consider the objects together as a system rather than considering them separately. To finish up this video here, we're going to take a look now at a new problem, which in my opinion really is kind of like a summary problem for the unit. We still do have one conservation of momentum video to do tomorrow, but to wrap up this video here, we're going to take a look at a problem that really kind of incorporates a lot of concepts that we've talked about over the last month or so, really. And that problem is generally referred to as the ballistic pendulum problem. So in a ballistic pendulum problem here, you have a bullet, which you can see here on the left in blue, shot at a usually a wooden block. And the masses here are labeled. Notice they usually label the bullet with a lowercase mass, uh, the block with a, an uppercase M for the mass, so we can differentiate between them. The bullet then is going to get stuck inside this wooden block, and the block is going to swing up to some height. This problem, as I hope you can tell, incorporates two of the big conservation laws that we've discussed over the last month or so. And so what I want to do here is just take a look at how we can analyze what's happening in this problem. First, let's just give a basic description of what's happening. here. In a ballistic pendulum, it's important to realize a ballistic pendulum is a device used to determine the launch speed of a projectile fired from a launcher. Obviously, now here in the modern age, we have more sophisticated methods. Usually what they do now is they fire a bullet into some sort of ballistic gel. And if they know how much friction the gel exerts on a bullet, they can determine the velocity of the bullet this way. But back in the day when they wanted to see how fast a bullet was shot from a gun, they would shoot the bullet into a block of wood, see how high the block of wood swung up in the air, and use that to determine the bullet's velocity. In order to determine the launch velocity of this projectile, it's fired at the pendulum bob and then becomes embedded inside and it swings up to some maximum height. And so ultimately, the question here is, what principles that we've discussed, discussed over the last month are coming to play in this problem? And hopefully everybody realizes, I'm sure many of you do just looking at that picture, the ballistic pendulum is a useful device because it utilizes concepts of both conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. And so what we're going to do here is we're really just going to walk through how you would analyze the problem using conservation of momentum and then conservation of energy. And then we'll go ahead and solve a problem. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. Okay, so taking a look at the diagram here, the first question we really want to ask is, how are we going to analyze this with momentum conservation? To put it a slightly different way, what kind of conservation of momentum problem is this? Looking at the diagram, you should realize one key thing, and that is that the bullet is embedded in the block. And what that tells us is that this collision is perfectly inelastic. And so the way that we're going to analyze that part of the problem is the exact same way we traditionally 
analyze a perfectly inelastic collision. Now, let's just say as a side note here, the problem used lowercase m and uppercase m, and I'm not like a huge fan of that. And so I think what we should do here is we should just go ahead showing these equations here by labeling the bullet as m1 and the block as m2. Now, there's no way that you would know this right now, but generally, the wooden block is just sitting there. And so the wooden block begins with a velocity that's equal to zero. And V1 in this problem is really what we're ultimately trying to determine. The whole point of a ballistic pendulum is to measure the launch velocity of the bullet. So in most of these problems here, that's going to be the unknown. So in a perfectly inelastic collision, keeping in mind that the momentum is conserved, we'll generally start this problem off by using the equation for the perfectly inelastic collision. So we have m1v1 plus m2v2 equals m1 plus m2 times v prime. And that's really all we can say for now. It's important to realize here in this problem, we have two unknowns. We don't know this, and we don't know v prime either. And so ultimately, the question is going to be, well, how can we solve an equation that has two unknowns? And the answer is we can't. What we have to do then is use conservation of energy to go ahead and solve for the final velocity of the bullet block system after the collision. The key thing to recognize, and I'm just going to go back to the picture here for a second, is that when the bullet becomes embedded in the block, it has a velocity. The bullet block system has velocity. And associated with that velocity, of course, is a kinetic energy. As the bullet block combo swings up to this maximum height here, that kinetic energy is converted into potential energy. So by being able to solve for the gravitational potential energy here, that gives you information about the kinetic energy down here, which ultimately is going to allow you to determine V prime. According to the equation we just derived for the momentum conservation, by finding V prime, then we'll be able to go ahead and find V1. And so we'll say here for energy conservation first, the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final gravitational potential energy. And so that means one half m v naught squared is going to be equal to mg delta y. Now, I'm just going to flesh this out a little bit to make a point. It is true here that the mass that you're going to use in the kinetic en energy part of the equation is the mass of the bullet block combo. So we will have to add those two masses together. And the mass that you're going to use for the potential energy part is going to be the same, the mass for the bullet block combo. And so notice here, those are going to cancel. And so what you're left over with is one half V naught squared equals G delta Y. And it's very important to realize in this problem, the V naught for the energy analysis is going to be equal to the V prime from the momentum analysis. And so then you can use that to transfer between equations. Now, before we go ahead and take a look at a problem, I want to be very clear about one key point. The initial kinetic energy of the bullet is not equal to the final gravitational potential energy of the bullet block system. Because this is a perfectly inelastic collision, some of the kinetic energy of the bullet is not transferred to the block because the kinetic energy isn't conserved in a perfectly inelastic collision. That is probably the most common mistake people make about this problem, and so it's a very important thing to take note of. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down, and when you hit play, we'll take a look at a problem. Let's take a look at a problem. This problem here says a bullet with a mass of 0 0.020 kilograms is fired at a ballistic pendulum block with a mass of 0 0.25 kilograms which is attached to a hook by a rope with a length of 0 0.15 meters. When the bullet is embedded in the block, the bullet block system swings up to make an angle of 30 degrees with the vertical. What is the muzzle velocity of the bullet? Of course, that's generally what they're asking you for in all these problems, and so that's what we'll do for our first example. Now, it's important to point out here, this is one of the more complicated examples of a ballistic pendulum problem, and that's because instead of telling us the height to which the system swung up, they give us here the length of the rope and the angle. And so what we'll need to do is a little bit of that pendulum thinking in order to find the height to use it 
in these problems. And so let's make a list of knowns here first before we get going. We'll say the mass of the bullet here is M1, like we were talking about earlier. And so that means M1 is 0 0.020 kilograms. The mass of the block, which we'll call M2, is 0 0.25 kilograms. We know here the angle is 30 degrees. We know the length of the rope is 0 0.15 degrees. And ultimately, or excuse me, 0 0.15 meters. And ultimately what we're trying to find is V1. Remember here, V2 is zero. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start with energy conservation in order to determine V prime. And so this is the velocity of the system after the collision. And so what we have here is the kinetic energy of the bullet block system right after the collision is equal to the potential energy of the bullet block system. And so that means one half of M1 plus M2 times V naught prime, which is, or excuse me, V naught squared, ultimately that's equal to V prime, is equal to M1 plus M2 times G delta Y. And as we mentioned before, the masses here cancel. And so what we're left over with is one half V naught squared equals G delta Y. Now, ultimately, what we're trying to solve this for is V prime. And so let's go ahead and just rewrite this by saying this is one half V prime squared equals G delta Y. And if we solve that for V prime, we get square root two times G times delta Y. And ultimately, what we need to do now is find out the height. And the way we find out the height is by thinking exactly the same way about this as we thought about a traditional pendulum. When the pendulum is hanging straight down, this is the length. Just the length of the rope is this vertical measurement here. Now when this thing has swung up to some height, the length of the rope is still the length of the rope. And ultimately what the height measurement is, is shown here, labeled delta y. Now if this is the angle, the angle made with the vertical, it should be fairly clear to everybody, and we talked about this when we were talking about pendulums already, is that this height here, delta y, is going to be this full length minus this piece. And since that piece is part of the triangle that's made here by these three sides, we can use trig to determine that side of the triangle. And ultimately what we get in recognizing that the length is the hypotenuse of the triangle, and this side of the triangle is adjacent, is that the cosine of that angle is going to be equal to this adjacent side, which we could just label as A here, over L. And so that means the adjacent side of the triangle is L cosine theta. And I'll go ahead over here and just label this A to make it perfectly clear. And that means, since we already said this height delta Y is the full length minus the adjacent side, that means delta Y is equal to L minus L cosine theta. That ultimately is what we need to now plug in to this conservation of energy equation. So instead of having 2G delta Y, we have 2G times L minus L cosine theta. And so that gives us V prime is equal to the square root of 2 times G, 9.8 meters per second squared, times L minus L cosine theta. So that's going to be 0 0.15 meters minus 0 0.15 meters times the cosine of 30 degrees. And when you do that math, making sure you plugged in all these numbers correctly here, you get that this V prime speed is 0 0.628 meters per second. Take a second to pause this video here and make sure you have all that written down. And when you hit play, we'll move on to the last part. Now that we have the final velocity here of the bullet block system after the collision, which notices the initial velocity that we used in this energy analysis, we're ready to apply momentum conservation. And as we said, momentum conservation, pretty simply put, is the regular analysis that we use for a perfectly inelastic collision. And so we'll start by writing the equation we traditionally use for a perfectly inelastic collision, m1v1 plus m2v2 equals m1 plus m2 times v prime. And so we'll start by getting rid of the m2v2 because we already said the block is initially at rest. 
And so we have M1 V1 equals M1 plus M2 times V prime. And since we're looking for V1, all we need to do is divide both sides by M1. So we have the sum of the masses times V prime over M1 is equal to V1. And so that means here we have M1, which is 0 0.020 kilograms, plus M2, 0 0.25 kilograms, times V prime, which we just calculated as 0 0.628 meters per second. We're going to divide all of that by M1, 0 0.020 kilograms. And we get a velocity for the bullet of 8.48 .48 meters per second. And that's it. It's important to realize why that answer makes sense. If you consider the fact that the mass of the block is 12 and a half times larger than the mass of the bullet, then it should make sense why the muzzle velocity is so much larger than the velocity of the combined objects after the collision. And so it's important to realize here, the momentum of the bullet is partially transferred to the block, but there's some kinetic energy lost there. As we already saw for the perfectly inelastic collision, how much kinetic energy is lost ultimately depends on the ratio of the masses. So once again here, that concept will hold up. How much the mass of the block is compared to the mass of the bullet is ultimately going to determine in some way, shape, or form, what the difference between the V prime is the velocity after the collision and the muzzle velocity of the bullet before it. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll take a look at one last problem that I want you to solve on your own before we go. So if you follow the link that was posted as the last item in the post for today, you'll see this simulator on a website called O-Physics, Interactive Physics Simulations, that we're actually going to use quite a bit this year. And so you'll notice here, for the values that are already set in this problem, they have this calculated initial velocity of the bullet as 123 meters per second. And it says that this is correct, or within 1%, rounding notwithstanding. And so what I want you to do here, rather than just use this exact setup already determined here to show exactly where the block goes, I want you to take the mass of the bullet slider and slide it all the way to the end. And I want you to take the initial velocity of the bullet slider and slide it all the way to the end. You can keep the mass of the wood block the same as four kilograms. And I want you to fire it. And I want you to use this slider here to ultimately determine the final height of the block to ultimately go ahead then and determine what the initial velocity of the bullet is. I'd like you to show all that work and submit that as the main assignment for today. Now, notice what I am asking you to do is solve this problem here the first time I've ever shown it to you, but hopefully you'll be able to use this simulator, the fact that it will tell you whether your answer is right or wrong to submit good work. And so once you calculate the initial velocity of this bullet for these parameters here, with these two sliders slid all the way to the right, and the mass of the wood block at four kilograms, that's it for today. Have a good one, everybody.